Hi, it looks as though some Muslims still have not caught the drift of what is going on in the real world and are still arguing that there is nothing wrong with the Islamic or even Quranic description of embryology. It shows that the supernatural is the best explanation. Now let me give you one of my favorite arguments now, something that the Islamic Education and Research Academy has studied for a while. And this is the embryology in the Quran. Ignorance is bliss. Well, there is. Or maybe there is not, and I am completely, utterly, and totally wrong. To help me make this decision, Hamza has finally managed to release his paper on Islamic embryology, all 59 pages of it. So let the Hamza bashing continue. But I was relieved to find that even his soulmates are questioning his methods while others only applaud his efforts to strengthen the Islamic Ummah. At all costs and means, it seems, if Hamza has had some negative encounters, shouldn't that give him sufficient cause to occasionally question his own judgment? In his, what he calls, research paper, he leads us on a fairy tale journey of discovery through a maze of tales and fables in an attempt to mislead as many Muslims as possible tricking them into believing that the Quran is correct and the book was personally written and signed off by a supernatural being called, to make life easy, God. First off, there are the usual pleas for please love me and allow me to believe in my favorite imaginary friend. Because I would argue in the absence of God, there is no ultimate meaning in our lives. Well, <laughs> this is followed by the deep philosophical question if we're going to end in the grave as worm meat, worm buffet, does it even matter that we existed? What is this? An argument? If yes, for what? Has Hamza ever heard of special pleading? If he wants to associate his religious book with science, wouldn't it be more appropriate to use scientific accuracy and objectivity? A scientist just running around and pleading, please accept my paper, simply doesn't cut it. Yet again and again, he repeats mantra-like. This is 100% in line with modern embryology. Hamza Tzotzis and his understanding of science has even brought on the ire of a real embryologist and biologist, P.Z. Myers, who somehow still manages to stay polite by calling what Hamza presents in his research paper overblown balderdash, bad science and stupidity. Am I surprised with Hamza's understanding of reality? The universe is only 1400 years old. His understanding of logics is hardly what I would describe as impeccable. What he tries to do is deliver a dichotomy which in the end only leaves one possible explanation, his personal God. The Islamic philosophy or the Islamic thinking sees a miracle as an act of impossibility which is more coherent, it makes more sense. Because if you exhaust all possible explanations in the natural world, then it means you have to start looking for supernatural explanations. Aira has studied embryology for a while, finding out points eloquently describing development of the human embryo. He relates them to modern science. But if you think it is scientific to throw around a vague word and hope that each and every scientist will read into this one vague word exactly what you want them to read into it, well, you will have a painful awakening. In science, one needs to show precisely what happens, where and when. Show the data and then still account for it. Is this what Hamza does? The AIRA senior researcher's paper starts on page 11 with a statement that we are not carbon-based but consist of all sorts of materials which he claims one finds in every kind of clay. To make his Quran fit, he simply states that the Quran says it's an extract of clay and since clay can consist of anything, the Quran is not wrong. Oh boy. He calls this stage 1. Instead of using faulty Greek and Islamic stages, today we use the Carnegie stages, which do not correspond in any way with what Hamza says. On page 12, he then says the next stage after clay is Nutfa. Now any masturbating male Muslim would find this in his hand and obvious. So the Quran only mentions an undefined liquid, not sperm, not an ovum, 
and not a zygote. If we look at his alaka stage, we don't find any references to this or leeches anywhere in the entire medical literature, referring to something that is by now one and a half millimeters large. In his desperate attempt at getting the Quran to say the right thing using alaka, he jumps from day 15 to the fourth week, then dates 19 to 25, then 19, then back to 21 to 24. And a lot of waffling in between. It is actually quite sad. I will not even go into the next stage as we have a huge problem. Well, whether to take the Quran at face value or include the wisdom of Muhammad, who claims that by now, after 80 days, the embryo is almost 10 centimeters long and still looks like a piece of something chewed. Well, you try putting a piece of 10 centimeters of meat into your mouth. I want to see that. Oh, what chaos. It makes me wonder exactly how much of this nonsense Hamza actually believes himself. So let's leave this ridiculous and pitiful pamphlet and go into the real world of history of embryology. This is how easy embryology could have been taught in the Quran without demanding too much of people even 2000 years ago. If we go to testes development, we see that initially male and female reproductive systems develop indifferently, i.e. the same way. The Wolfian and Mullerian ducts contribute the majority of male and female internal genital tracts. They are not located anywhere in between the backbone and the ribs, as is often asserted by uneducated Muslim apologists, but right at the bottom of the bottom, from where the testes then descend into the scrotum. Maybe the word descend is the cause of the misunderstanding or deliberate misleading. On this diagram, you can see the location very clearly, and I think anyone will agree this is nowhere near the ribs. So this stupid lie, is it now buried once and for all? If we go all the way to the bottom of the page and click on embryology history, we get an overview from the earliest days until today. And this is where we find our good old friend Keith Moore, the one Hamza still liked in Ireland, but who seems to have since fallen from grace. Well, he's under historic textbooks, not the one with the Islamic editions, but the one with the scientifically correct contents. Clicking on Arabian medicine, we get to a page which reveals some interesting facts. It shows that as much as I research, I always find others have done the same and have made similar finds, which in this case are concisely presented in a much better format than mine. So what have the authors of this text found? First of all, it was Arabs, not Muslims, who advanced medicine and other sciences in the Middle or Medieval Ages. Reading through this text, we get a feeling for the huge advancements Arab scientists made. If they were Muslims, I'd hate to see their heavenly scorecard after they introduced alcohol into the picture. Well, we see here that others also notice the all too obvious copying of Greek, Indian and Persian sources and the distribution of this knowledge into the Arab world via Gandhi Shapur. What is interesting is the reference to a Christian doctor who was educated there and is called Muhammad's chief medical advisor. But I'm sure Hamza sources will find a way of erasing or discounting this source as well. There are three points I'd like to take away from this. Arabians did copy and translate freely, they also originated and added considerably to medical knowledge. The first distinguished Arabian physician was Haritz bin Kalada, who received his education in the Estonian school at Gondeshapur about the beginning of the 7th century. Thus, at the very outset, the science of medicine was divorced from religion among the Arabians. For if the Prophet himself could employ the services of an unbeliever, surely others might follow his example. These religious fanatics were willing to employ unbelieving physicians and their physicians themselves to turn to the scientific works of Hippocrates and Galen for medical instruction, rather than to religious works. Even Muhammad himself professed some knowledge of medicine and often relied upon this knowledge in treating ailments rather than upon prayers or incantations. An important point I have tried to make endless times needs to be repeated here. The Arab Golden Age is just that. Some of the famous names were not Muslims but Arabs, such as Hunayn ben Isaac, a Christian Arab of Baghdad, 
and many, many others. So the constant hijacking of really great advancements of Arabs by fundamentalist Muslims should come to a halt as more and more people get educated on this topic. In conclusion, I see Hamza Tzatzis, the head of the AIRA research and lecturer for AIRA, delivering a really poor and childishly primitive paper. If I would rely on this drivel to make up my mind on how to view Islam, I would think the believers are gullible, uneducated goons. It will not impress anyone who can try to verify his claims and find the truth, but will undoubtedly amaze numerous Muslims who can't or mainly do not want to check the validity of any of the assertions and claims. They say ignorance is bliss. For the first time in my life, I agree. I wish I had never uncovered the awful truth. <laughs>